Hi, everyone. This is Eva Minkoff, your co-host of the Invisible Not Broken podcast, which has now become the Invisible Not Broken network. Within this network, we are continuing to produce interviews by Monica and myself, but since she and I have such different styles, we've decided to put them under different names. Monica will be hosting the Explicitly Sick podcast and I the Wellacopia podcast. Otherwise, nothing has actually changed. So moving on now. For those of you tuning in for the first time, again, my name is Eva Minkoff. I'm a fibromyalgia warrior and the founder of Wellacopia, the matching site for patient practitioner relationships. We connect wellness seekers with their ideal partners in care. Visit wellacopia.com to match with your dream doctor, nutritionist, therapist, and more. In this episode, I meet with Dr. Ginevra Lipton, a world-renowned board certified MD known for her extensive work and dedication specifically to those with fibromyalgia, which she has as well. Dr. Lipton is one of the few specialists to focus solely on treating fibromyalgia, taking a holistic approach that combines Western and alternative medicine. She is here to share her personal journey with fibro and how learning to love her illness has made her a better doctor and a better person. Whether you have fibro or not, Everything we talk about stands true, regardless of your diagnosis or lack thereof. Just a reminder that all conversations and health claims on this podcast are based on individual experiences and expertise. Everyone has their own personal and professional truths and should be treated as such. Okay, let's get started. I think from a doctor perspective, when you're working in like the healthcare system, there's so much um, com- data entry that you have to do. I mean, you really can't build a relationship if you are facing away from a person and you know typing on your keyboard. Like even just eye contact and just a few minutes of actual conversation, as opposed to like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And when was your last name again? You know what I mean? Like <laughs> right there. If we can figure out a way to sort of, I mean, technology is great and we need it, but you really lose that human element. Um, on my first visits with patients, I don't have my computer in the room. I mean, I do on later visits, that first visit, which is really about building that connection. Like you can't have, I can't be typing while you're telling me about your, you know, traumatic experience at age 12 that led to you developing fibromyalgia. Like how that doesn't work, right? So yeah, that's my two cents. Like take the computer out of the equation for just five minutes. That is, that is a really good piece of advice. Uh, and even if it's just for the first minute or two, even that, like if they really need to re- be recording certain things in order to engage with that person, those first few minutes or even just few seconds matter so yeah. much. I mean, think about when you're on a first date with someone. Yeah. Like if that person takes their phone out and is like, you know, texting within 30 seconds, you're going to be like, okay done but if they engage eye contact you know giving you attention really trying to hear what you're saying and you're right it doesn't have to take that long it can take a few minutes I mean so yeah that's I try really hard along with actually touching like I think touch is still important whether it's shaking hands or um I'm a big I'm a hugger so I warn people but you know usually (laughs) at my at the end of my first appointment, I usually like give people a hug. And I think there's an exchange of energy and love, I guess, for lack of a better word, which is part of the healing um, experience, which in conventional medicine has totally been removed because it's very sort of, I'm over here and you're, I don't, I, not that, I mean, people have varying levels of comfort with that. And, but I think remembering that touch is connection and healing and even a, a handshake or a gentle pat, you know, with fibromyalgia, you have to be gentle, gentle hug. But I, I don't, I mean, I will tell you, nobody has ever turned down my offer of a hug. Like really, that's not, I mean, I would be okay if they did, but it's, I think that's an important start to kind of the connection, the relationship. So, but in med school, we are definitely taught that that's not okay. And that, you know, we're going to be um, violating some sort of, I don't know, 
sacred code of doctors that we don't touch people. Like, that's, <laughs> I got over that a long time ago. Uh, no wonder your patients love you. I think that is one of the most wonderful thing I've, things I've ever heard a, patient, a, well, a doctor do. And we all want to be hugged, even when we think we don't or we say we don't. Uh, there's nothing better than connecting with a human being like that. And it's such a mutual thing. Like a hug is never really one way. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So. This one's beautiful. I actually was thinking about how to talk, uh, how to start my TED talk. And I def I have not, uh, I have not said on anything yet, <laughs> but I'm open to brainstorming. But one idea that came to my mind because I'm comparing doctor patient relationships to uh, romantic relationships uh, is like, what if you married your doctor? <laughs> like, and I hope you all are looking at me very confused right now. <laughs> I think that would get people's attention. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, no, scratch that. That's not what I meant. <laughs> I love also the irony that I love talking about doctor-patient relationships, romantic relationships, and then Wellacopia is essentially match.com, right? Right. Right. And I was like, it's totally a coincidence that I married a doctor and met him online. <laughs> Did you actually marry a doctor and yeah. met him online? <laughs> yeah. It is unrelated, but... but that is not. hilarious. And yeah. you got to tie that into your TED Talk somehow. You got to pull that Somehow, it really yes. starts to be like, by the way, I did marry one, but he wasn't mine. He's a pediatrician, so he better not be mine. <laughs> well, you know who does the best TED Talks I have ever seen in my life is uh, Brene Brown. Have you watched her? Oh my God, yes. I love her. Love. She is like a masterclass in how to connect with an audience and like her just public speaking. Like I watch her and I'm like, yeah, um, I actually have her book, Dare to Lead, over there. She is the queen of vulnerability. And vulnerability is not what people think it is. It's, it's being honest and transparent about who you are and your flaws. Yeah. And I love it. I eat it up. I'm all about that. Me too. Me too. I'm a big Brene Brown fan. So you're, you're on it. So yeah, just watch her do her TED Talks, and then you'll model after that, and you'll be... I can already <laughs> tell you're going to be fabulous. You got it. I'm pumped. I uh, really, I just want to get this idea out there past the podcast. Um, although I love that I get to speak my mind here, but this, I, I wholeheartedly feel that this would be a game changer in healthcare if we all looked at patients and we all looked at doctors as humans, which sounds absurd, right? Like, of course they're humans, but if you really think about how we look at doctors and talk to doctors, we would not do the same thing with our spouse or our, I don't know, our children or our best friend or our colleague and vice versa. Um, I gotten, I, I always bring up my husband, uh, but <laughs> cause he's just my first like touchstone of what yeah. it's like in the medical system. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's amazing. He'll say things to me in like, the nice feeling way that he would say to his patients and even though he's very compassionate in a way that would be sort of like cold in medical terminology yep because that's how he's yep. trained yep we are completely trained to not to a not have human emotion it's it's considered a sign of weakness it's almost like the military like when you go through the ranks of conventional medical training go through residency um there's this aspect of like, you can't cry, you can't show fear, you can't show emotions, you can't show um, embarrassment around making a mistake. Like we're not allowed to talk about mistakes, any kind of human vulnerability experience. So imagine when you get sick as a doctor. So I'm in medical school, right? I get sick, I don't know what's going on. I'm trying to um, process this and talk about it with my colleagues and my attending professors. And there was, it, it just was like this wall, like it was not acceptable to talk about. And um, people said, even doctors I really respected said horrible things to me about fibromyalgia. Like this was 20 years ago, mind you, but 
a lot of, I heard a lot of, it's all in your head. Um, uh, it's not real. I don't believe in it. And it was devastating, like doubly devastating. Cause here I had like kind of shown my inner experience and been really rejected and told that I couldn't talk about that. And I remember thinking how completely messed up it was that here I am a doctor trying to learn how to take care of people who are sick, but it's not okay for me to have the experience of being sick. And like, we're supposed to be this sort of perfect deity up here, you know, that, that just weighs down on these humans that are dealing with these struggles. And I'm like, yeah, no, like we also are human. And yes, fibromyalgia can happen to one of you. And it did happen to me. Um, and I'm still angry about it. Like I'm still angry about the kind of experience and treatment that I had during medical school. Um, but I learned, I just had to not talk about it. I kind of went undercover and just didn't talk about it all through medical school and residency until on my very last day of residency, I gave a grand rounds talk and I was like, screw this. Like people need to know. And so I feel like it was almost like coming out. Like I was sharing this deep, you know, um, dark secret um, that I had fibromyalgia. And I remember like my professors, like their jaws kind of dropped. There was just surprise. And then so many of my colleagues came up to me afterwards and were like, oh my God, thank you for saying that. Like my mom has fibromyalgia, my sister has fibromyalgia. Like, do you know a good doctor that, you know, I could recommend so-and-so to? And I remember being like, oh my God, like it was worth it. It was totally worth it. Of course, I did break down in tears during that talk. And I was like, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. Oh, crying. But I think, you know, it was so personal and so um, painful um, to kind of talk about it. Um, and it's okay if you cry during your TED Talk. I will say that because people do <laughs> understand the, I think that really speaks to our human component. And honestly, doctors are human and trying to help them to remember that and to have our medical system allow for that. Like truly, we are not allowed to be, I mean, if we make a mistake, people die, right? We can, our job is really um, high stakes, but we are human and we do make mistakes and we have to be able to kind of talk about it in a, in a way that um, acknowledges our humanity. And I haven't figured out a good way to do that. So I just am, I just am what I am. <laughs> and you I have people. Have, that helps. Yeah, I, I, and I, I feel like, I mean, I never, I, it's, it, I'm a really private person. Like it's very, I'm a big introvert. I'm a private person. And it's been really hard for me to share my own story because it feels so like, uh, like once you share your story, once you're out there, you're really out there. And um, people can be really cruel on online. Um, some of my colleagues, even now doctors are not kind to me and um, think I'm kind of a weirdo quack, you know, um, but I've had to kind of weigh like what's more important to me. And it's more important to me to share my story in a way that can help people and maybe move the needle than, than to kind of be stuck in my own shyness about it. So I, I think a lot of people that share their story or become influencers in kind of the chronic illness community have had to make that same calculation. I mean, I don't think anybody's like, you know what I want to do when I grow up? I want to be chronically ill and then talk about it publicly. <laughs> <laughs> that'll be great and nobody ever right exactly <laughs> but we end up doing it because it's it's important and we can kind of see the end the need for it yeah it's uh i mean thank you for I mean, you're on you're on this podcast doing exactly that and it's it's is so admirable when someone takes their deepest darkest secrets and fears and doubts and says and just like spills them on the table and go here they are yep here's my guts <laughs> take them or leave them yep and you're doing it and putting yourself aside putting your pride aside and being like this is what's best for others yeah others like me and others who aren't like me who don't who don't know yeah well thank you for doing it too and for making wellacopia which is a really cool thing thank you 
So tell us about how you have applied self-care throughout your life when you were in like the thick of fibro and even now and and how you also educate and inspire your patients to do the same. Sure. So, I mean, for me, when I developed fibromyalgia in medical school, I really was on my own. I didn't have a lot of medical guidance. Um, and I had to do a lot of work to try and figure out what helped me. Um, and, you know, I tried a lot of things that didn't work. So I tried a lot of um, supplements, diets, um, different alternative practices, um, things that didn't help me and some things that did. So, so part of like the first portion of self-care for me is really viewing yourself as sort of a, a one person science experiment and really trying to like observe, okay, how, how do I, how do I feel when I take this supplement? Okay. Do I notice a difference or do I not, you know, and, and it can be hard because it's hard to be objective about ourselves. So I did find that um, recording my symptoms in a journal helped me to figure out, okay, when I made that change or this, did it help me or not? And for me, the things that really made a difference were cutting out dairy. Dairy was a big um, source of inflammation in my body. So through kind of trial and error and working with a naturopath, I was able to figure out, okay, dairy, I feel a lot better going off dairy. Then once I had that information, making the actual lifestyle change to avoid dairy was a lot easier because I kind of knew the information like, okay, like I can choose to eat the ice cream if I want to, but I know that it's going to make me feel really achy and grumpy for like three days and really flare up my symptoms. And like, is it worth it? Like it, the equation becomes a lot easier. So I think the first portion was really gathering information. And um, when you're trying to look at things like diet or exercise or movement or different supplements, um, trying to kind of isolate and making one change at a time as much as possible. As humans, we tend to sometimes get in this like, I'm gonna do this 20 things at once. You know, I'm gonna take these 10 supplements and make this whole, you know, avoid these five food groups. And then we don't really know what's doing what and it's overwhelming. And then we, speaking from experience, tend to then flame out, right? So trying to keep it as like simple as possible, like just avoiding dairy. Okay, how do I feel? Um, so making some dietary changes made a huge difference. Um, the other thing that really helped me was figuring out how to actually get into deep sleep. So uh, one of the things that I, I use for myself and a lot of my patients have found benefit with is magnesium. So just magnesium supplementation at night. Um, I use a lot of different herbal um, supplements for sleep uh, and CBD and cannabis based um, medications can be really helpful for sleep. So trial and error again to find out what helped me for sleep versus what didn't. And sometimes my needs have kind of changed over the years. Uh, when I was in uh, residency and I was doing like 80 to 100 an hour week work weeks and my schedule was all over the place like I was working nights and then I was working that's when I found I really need a sleep medication. Like I have to say Ambien gets a bad rep, but it really saved my life in uh, <laughs> residency because I was able to sleep even when my schedule was off. So even like to this day, the combination of um, herbal sleep aids, magnesium, Ambien, that is really, really helpful for me and makes a world of difference as far as getting into deep sleep and feeling rested in the morning. But again, trial and error, like what worked for me might not work for my patient, you know, Jennifer that comes in to see me. So for her, it might be a different combination of things. So, and I can't really predict, I can say, well, based on your symptoms, I think this is the most likely thing that will help you. But she's the one that's gonna have to try it and observe and kind of um, report back to me. So I ask all my patients to try to make one change at a time, try to record their symptoms, and then, uh, then we can kind of use that information together to make the next adjustment. So for me, a, a huge portion of self-care was simply observation and detailed, you know, really treating myself like a scientific experiment, a guinea pig, so to speak. Um, sometimes things didn't work. Like 
I tried acupuncture four different times when I was in medical school and residency. And for me personally, I just never got much benefit from it. Other people have found huge benefit from it. So it's not, it's not a one size fits all scenario, which makes as a healthcare provider and as somebody with fibromyalgia, it's, it makes it a lot harder because it's not like, ah, oh, yes, take this one supplement or do this one thing and you'll feel so much better. Like it's, it's, there's options and you have to be able to kind of find the right combo for you. So, um, self, self care for me is observation and then making lifestyle changes as I can. Uh, I also have found though, that if I just try to do it in like a, like a top down kind of way, like, a, okay, Ginevra, I know that you need to be exercising more and eating less sugar. If I just try to do that for myself in sort of a, a punitive way, it does not work. And instead I found if I can do it in a way from my body feels better when I exercise more or when I even do some gentle stretching out of love for myself, I'm going to try to do this, but if I don't do it, it's okay. So translating self-care into really more self-love or self-compassion. Um, and I learned, I really kind of learned some of the good phrasing around it from our mutual friend, Tammy Stackelhouse, who's a great, really great uh, fibromyalgia health coach. And a piece of what she says is, you know, self-care is, is really not, it's really not about the activities that you do for yourself, although that is important. It's really about how you talk to your, about yourself, the words that you use, the language around yourself. For example, like, let's say you decide, I don't want to go to this holiday party because I, I feel like it's going to give me, you know, it's noisy, people are, it's stressful, I'm going to eat crappy food, it's going to put me into a flare. If the language you use around that is, my stupid body won't let me go to this party, I hate it, you know, like if you, if you kind of turn it into sort of a negative piece, your, your body's going to feel that. But if you can shift your language around it, to, and she has a really good way of phrasing it, but I choose not to do this because my body, my body will feel better. I'm doing this for my body, for my health. That's why I'm choosing not to go to this party. And it, and it becomes just really a subtle shift can make a difference as far as how you feel about your choices. And so if you translate self-care into self-love, then it makes choosing activities that help you to feel better easier. So I am a very driven person and I try, I want to accomplish a lot in every day. And most of us are like that, right? Like we have these like really high expect, like I've got this to-do list of 20 things that I'm going to accomplish. Um, and I can, it's very easy for me to feel really disappointed that I only accomplished maybe one or two out of my list of 20. But then if you, change it to, wow, I accomplished those two things today. I'm so, thank you, body. Thank you for, you know, working with me to accomplish those two things. And it can sound really sort of um, simplistic, but I'm telling you, it makes such a difference. Just the kind words that we use in our head to talk to ourselves about it. Um, I, for me, that makes a difference in my daily life as far as how I feel about what I can accomplish as somebody with a chronic illness that's trying to run a medical practice, it's trying to be a mom, it's trying to be a wife, you know, trying to be a friend. Um, there's never enough of me to go around. And I think every human experiences that feeling. Like I, there's more that we want to do than we can. And trying to focus on what we have done rather than what we haven't, that's, that's what I learned from Tammy. Thank you, Tammy. <laughs> she's, she's brilliant. Um, and you know, this is airing in uh, January, which is post holiday season. And, um, and it's new year's resolution time. I was going to say, yeah, January, January. 
<laughs> is when this, what you were saying really hits home, especially the, I want to change everything right now and I want to be perfect and nothing's going to stop me. It, I'm all for positive thinking. In fact, everything that you're talking about really is positive thinking in a way, in simplest terms, it's, it can be like glass half full rather than half empty, right? Yeah, exactly. But it can also be perceived as, or like you, you shoot too high in expectations yep. right off the bat. And yep. then, and then I'm like holding a glass here, like, and then it flips half empty. Yep. Yep. So I have found that if I set the bar really low for myself, like the joke I say is like, set the bar so low for yourself. I say this to my patients that if you accidentally trip, you're going to fall over the bar and then you're going to be like, I made it over the bar as opposed to setting it like high enough that you have to kind of effort to go over it. So the example that I will tell you that comes up for me every night in my life is there are some stretches that if I do them every night, I feel better the next morning. So they're really simple. It takes me like five minutes and it's really like just gentle kind of, you know, laying on the floor with my arms to my side and stretching my pec muscles. And I've got this little pillow thing that I, I want to do um, some neck, you know, rolling on literally five minutes. Every night before bed, I have this battle with myself because I'm like, oh, I just want to go to bed. I don't want to do my stupid stretches. It's like extra five minutes. And my husband's like, do your stretches. You'll feel better. And I'm like, I don't want to. So <laughs> I feel so I would say about 50% of the time, I don't do my stretches, go to bed. The next morning, I'm like, oh, I should go my stretches. But I found if I tell myself, okay, Ginevra, you don't have to do five minutes of stretching. Just do 30 seconds. And I can convince myself to get down and do 30 seconds because it's so easy. It's like, oh, 30 seconds. It's like barely a TV commercial, right? Like I'll do it, I can, then I can move on and go to bed. But here's the thing, inevitably, once I get down and I'm doing it and it's been 30 seconds, I'm like, oh, this feels good. Oh yeah, I keep doing So if I start it, I'll do the rest. But if I tell myself, you have to do five minutes of stretching, I won't freaking do it because it feels like too much. But 30 seconds, I can trick myself. So it's also sort of tricking myself and making the bar low enough that I can do it. Same, I mean, exercise is another thing, like, ugh, I don't wanna do 20 minutes of exercise. You know, in New Year's resolution time, we're like, okay, I'm gonna do 30 minutes of aerobic exercise three times a week, and if I can't do that, I'm just not gonna do it. But in reality, if you can tell yourself, okay, do, do one minute of exercise, and that's it the odds are pretty good that if you start and do that one minute, you're going to be like, okay, I can do a few more minutes. And then you kind of, again, it's like, I've, I've, I've accomplished it. Yay. And then that really, that sets, sets you up for success. I think setting the bar high really sets us for failure. And then, I mean, I think, what is it like 70% of all new year's resolutions are broken by the end of January. Like, we as yeah. humans we do this every year. I think every it's year it doesn't work. But we do it again. Yep. Oh, and I'm definitely at uh one of those people or have been many, many times. I've gotten better over the years at taking on resolutions that are more realistic. Um, but I I I completely agree with what you're saying that also the act of doing something consistently that is trip over status like so little that you you know it's like there's really no reason why not it's just making something a habit at all um that i find to be really key so actually even right before this this call uh i really wanted to work out beforehand because i i, I didn't earlier and me moving really like you said with your stretching makes a big difference for my pain so i like to do intentional movement I don't know if I want to call that exercise every day, but it's something like, hey, body, we're going to do something today to do it. Yep. In, in Therapeutic that. movement, I call it. Yes, yep. exactly. So, all right, this sounds a little funny, but um, I was in the kitchen waiting for something to cook. I actually happen to have pretty good floor space. I laid on my stomach and I did what's called like the Superman. You know what I'm talking about? Yep. You, lay, yep. you lay on your stomach, 
you stretch your arms out in front of you, your legs behind you, and then you try to kind of crunch your back and you're, you lift up like you're Superman. And yeah. I, I love that pose because one, it makes you feel freaking powerful. Yep. <laughs> and I'm using my whole back, my butt, my legs. And I just did that up and down for like sort of a five minute thing. And I said, okay, so I didn't work out today, but I felt like Superman for five minutes. Yes, that is awesome. I love that. <laughs> That's exactly, well, yeah. as opposed to feeling like, oh, I didn't work out today. Like, uh, yeah, you know, like I'm annoyed at myself or I'm frustrated. Like, that's brilliant. And you had to wait those five minutes anyways for food to cook. So it was <laughs> yes, exactly. brilliant. You have to be very, we have to be creative and work with what's actually happening in our lives. You know, we tend to have this unrealistic view sometimes or these idealistic ideas about what we can do. And it comes a lot in diet. I see that a lot when I talk to patients about diet. They're like, oh, I know I got to do the whole 30 diet. And, you know, and part of what I really don't like about kind of the social media culture is that all those people that take pictures of their beautiful food that they're eating, that's all like, vegan and so perfectly prepared and I'm just like oh my god like I really want people to take pictures of what they're actually eating like here's this stale granola bar that I ate from my desk drawer you know but, or even if it's healthy it doesn't always look good like honestly a lot of the, I actually do cook mostly vegan at home it's cheaper and easier and I, I like it um but it usually looks like mush of some sort it is right. not appealing I made a green curry today and it's like curry and bits of broccoli in there and tofu and it doesn't look appealing i'm not right. at a thai restaurant where they make it all fancy <laughs> right with your little basil sprig and yeah but i think that that creates like this this feeling of sort of we're sort of like set up to feel like a failure because here you know with chronic illness sometimes you don't have the energy to go shopping for beautiful food or chop the vegetables or you know there there can feel like so many barriers and so like here's how we are actually eating over here and here's how we want to eat over here and like we don't make any diet changes until we feel like we can live this beautiful instagram perfect whole 30 life and i feel like that just does not does not work um and what i try to tell my patients and myself is just try to add more healthy foods however you can whether it's attractive green curry or not um but not expecting our our you know what comes out of our kitchen to suddenly look like a it's in a whole 30 cookbook and and knowing that we're gonna fall off the rails like i don't do well with very strict diets um i tried whole 30 myself because uh one of the uh, people in my workplace challenged me to do it and I'm kind of a competitive person. I was like, yeah, I can do a whole 30, no problem. No carbs, 30 days, got it. So I did okay till day 17 and then I flamed out big time and I had, uh, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say this, but I have a cocktail and some chocolate because on the whole 30 diet, you can't have alcohol, you can't have sugar, you can't have chocolate. And I, I really flamed out pretty pretty dramatically um, because those are my comfort foods, my comfort things. And I had, uh, I had forgotten about that emotional component for me of eating. Oh yeah, it's there. When I'm stressed, I reach for chocolate, right? And so what I realized is I could do something like the Whole30, which I did, here's the annoying thing is I did feel really good eating that way. Like my body felt really good eating Whole30, which is like no gluten, no dairy, no sugar, very low carbs. Um, but my emotions didn't, it wasn't, I wasn't getting kind of fed what I needed to be fed emotionally. So I found if I modified it so that I could add some chocolate or some other little treats, I was able to do it and do it in my, my way. Right. And it wasn't pretty. And it definitely did not look like the whole 30 cookbook. Um, and it was a little haphazard, but I was able to make it work in a way that felt good to me. And I still got some of the benefits like my gut definitely appreciated I lost a little bit of weight and you know I felt good during that time um and I have found that if I just tell patients hey I'd like you to try the whole 30 you know I have some patients with diabetes and things like that 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 really benefit from that kind of dramatic approach and 
when I show them the cookbook and they see everything that they can't eat, you should see, it's like, ah, like just, it's like deer in the headlights. Like, I, what are you talking about? I can't do this. But if I then sort of say, well, you can modify it. You can have this and that, and, you know, you know, find a way that works for you. Um, it's much more manageable. Um, but we, there's something about the, the human condition where we want to do things perfectly. And then there's something about social media that has added this like extra level of, I don't know, expectation around a curated, beautiful life that is just so not realistic and kind of annoys me sometimes, you know? I just don't, I don't feel like it's healthy, really. No, I, I don't think it is either. I'm not anti-social media, but I'm, I'm anti a lot of what it calls for, like how it survives. Actually, we were talking about TED Talks. I today watched uh, Joseph, Joseph Gordon-Levitt's TED Talk, which came out I haven't seen it. in September. And it was about seeking attention versus paying attention and how all of like Instagram in particular and, and Twitter and Facebook, they, um, they make you addicted to likes and attention. And therefore everything that we do is about intention, attention. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, you're so right. <laughs> it's, it's like, no, think about how, what you're doing and what that means. Pay attention to what the, the message is that you want to send and how you can creatively impact other people's lives. Not like how many follows and likes and comments can I get? Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and there is power in social media. I mean, I think good change can happen oh, yeah. with oh, yeah. it for sure. Um, social movements can happen with it, but yeah, I like, I'm going to watch that Ted talk. That's, that sounds good. It's a good one. I highly recommend. Um, and he definitely, you know, puts himself on the hot seat there too, being an actor. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I, which is a little bit about seeking attention maybe. Yeah. yeah. I appreciated it a lot. Um, but yeah, this, we definitely live in this perfectionist culture and even, I still, I don't know how this happens, but like we talk about not being perfectionist in this perfect perfectionist way. Right. You know what I mean, right. like, <laughs> oh, look at me, I'm so real and I'm so messy and I'm so that. And then somehow they do it in like the most appealing, perfect way. Right. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know what to do. And then, so uh, then, then there's, I guess, my stance on it where I want to be very raw and real with people online and maybe put up a sweaty photo or feeling like <laughs> shit or whatever. And then I think to myself, does anybody really care or right. <laughs> anyone really want to do that? And, um, and I don't know. <laughs> I, I, guess know. I don't, I don't have a good answer either. And I'm always like, do people <laughs> really want to see like a sweaty photo of their doctor? Like, I don't know. Is that? Yeah. Um, but like a perfect example, oh, a perfect example is, um, so I, one treatment that really has helped me that I usually, I like to talk about when I'm doing a interview is something called myofascial release. I don't know if you've um, heard anything about it, but it's, it's, oh, yeah. it's, it's really, it was the thing, it was the thing that I found um, while I was in medical school that really made a difference as far as my pain levels. And those stretches that I talked about trying to do every night, those are kind of myofascial release stretches. So basically it's just kind of really slow, gentle stretching. And when you're getting myofascial release there, be with a provider, they're kind of um, with their hands assisting this the stretch. And it's not a massage. It's it's very kind of slow and, and it will take three to five minutes in a stretch. So uh, what I found is when I was in medical school, I was working with this physical therapist who liked to take before and after pictures. So she would take a picture of your posture before and then she would work with you, do myofascial release. I did pretty intense um, therapy for like twice a week for about three months. And then she did an after picture. And um, I was in my underwear in these pictures, but the change is so dramatic. Like in my posture, like in the beginning, I'm like really forward and you can almost see in my body where I'm hurting. And it's like really forward and, and my pelvis is all askew. And um, I, I looked at those pictures and I thought they were so amazing and I, I really wanted to like share them but my husband was like you can't put that online like you can't share that in your you know talks because 
like you're in your underwear. And as he kindly told me, he's like, and it's not like nice underwear. <laughs> 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 right so they're not like you know they're 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 not in like great shape it's like you know not photoshop <laughs> yeah it was like no it, there's no photoshopping but someday i'm gonna figure out a way to like black out or you know put me in a swimsuit or something <laughs> because it I, I really wanted to show the reality of myself doing this kind of and and to also show how effective this treatment can be and in my in my follow pictures I'm my posture I'm like my shoulders are back my head is up and I'm smiling like you can really see the the difference in my energy um and that was what I was focusing on in the pictures but uh apparently that might be too raw to maybe share and maybe people don't want to see their doctor in their saggy underwear so anyway <laughs> <laughs> I think it humanizes the experience, but that's just me. And see, that's what I thought. Yeah, I see. I would like that, but uh, at the same time, we can't please everybody. We no. can't. You know what? Some people are. Some people are gonna love this episode. Some people are not gonna like this. Some people right. love and hate things, and we can't always control that. Um, that's true. Always try not to offend, if possible. But you know what? Sometimes that happens too. Yep, that's true. <laughs> yep, yep. What are you gonna do? Uh, but, you know, we've been talking as uh, two people with fibromyalgia and also, I mean, I'm d definitely not a doctor, but someone who has, I guess, helped people with their fibromyalgia in terms of their health. Um, but everything you said is not exclusive to fibromyalgia in the slightest. And we're True. talking, we're talking lifestyle changes that are right for you as an individual. Um, baby steps. Gotta love those baby steps. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, self, self love, you know, speaking compassionately and, and loving yourself and coming from a place of kind of positivity as much as you can. Yeah. That, that's not even just exclusive to people with illness. That's like human condition. Any human can benefit from that. Yeah, actually, I'd love to dive deeper into that. Can you give some more examples of what self love looks like? I know you gave some earlier, but I just think this is so important we throw around this this term of self love self compassion but what is that what does that really mean a lot of people ask me what do you mean you love yourself or you show yourself love because i will i will admit i love myself i don't think i'm like the best in any way i am definitely without not without flaws um i yeah i have lots of things that are negative but i I do love myself and I feel like I'm my friend. Yeah. Yeah. So making friends with your body. That's another Tammy saying, which mm -hmm. I love. Yes. So for me, uh, where it has really come to play in my life is uh, accepting both the positives and the negatives of my illness. For example, the first, I don't know, three or four years after I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia, I really felt very depressed, I would say, and very discouraged about what I was going to be able to do with my life. Um, but then I, I realized that my hypersensitive nervous system was actually sort of a superpower that I, I actually, it helped me to become a more intuitive person. Like I had a, a greater sense of when other people's emotions were shifting around me. Um, I think it helped me to become a better spouse and definitely a better doctor because I could understand more what not just patients with fibromyalgia were going through, but I felt like I could have a better sensitivity to what my patient sitting in the exam room was experiencing. So like those subtle shifts in like a facial expression or a vocal tone, um, I felt like I could see how my, my extra sensitivity um, had a positive nature to it. And in a way, it sounds really weird, but in a way I have come to love my illness because it has, I think, enabled me to be a much better doctor than I would have been without it. Because I understand, at least from a fibromyalgia lens, the human experience, the, the human experience of pain and suffering. We, we all experience 
that in life. We all, none of us make it through life without experiencing pain and suffering. It just looks different for each of us. Um, but because of my experience with the fibromyalgia aspect, the way that we suffer with fibromyalgia, I feel like it made me a better doctor and a better human. And that shift of sort of loving my illness, I mean, don't get me wrong, if somebody came out tomorrow, if Dr. Oz was like, I've got the cure for fibromyalgia, I'd be like, cool, sign me up. Like, I'm not, it's not like I want it, right? Like I would happily relinquish it, but it's, it is here. It is part of me that it's part of how my nervous system interacts with the world. Um, and loving it has enabled me to sort of look at myself differently, to laugh at myself, like sometimes I laugh at my um, unrealistic expectations about what I can accomplish in a day. I'm like, ha, that was silly. Like I really thought I could do those 20 things as opposed to like beating myself up over it. Um, I also sometimes laugh about my sensitivities. You know, I really like the temperature to be just right the light to be just right. Most of us with fibromyalgia are pretty particular, like our clothing, right? Like, oh, this bra is itchy or I can't even wear. And when I think about people that don't have fibromyalgia and they're like, what are you talking about? Like, I never even noticed the tag in my bra. Whereas those of us with fibromyalgia are like, oh my God, this, oh, it's unbearable, you know? <laughs> Story of my life. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I, I mean, I have a heck of a time trying to find exam chairs that everybody in my, uh, nobody lights. I'm like, well, some people find these are comfortable. Some people find that like, we're all, you know, very sensitive. And what I found is if I could see the beauty in that, it made me not feel like a weirdo. So I like to use the analogy of orchids. So orchids are really beautiful jungle flowers that require the temperature to be between 68 and 72. And they have this very specific humidity and they all like slightly different. I mean, there are, they are the, the pickiest flowers you can possibly imagine. But I think they are also the most rare and beautiful flowers. So I feel like I've been able to see my body as like an orchid. Like, wow, body, you really like things to be a certain way, don't you? Like, <laughs> and for me, that's just my, I have like a goofy sense of humor. So for me, kind of being able to joke about it makes it so that I don't feel like a freak. Like I can say, you know, I'm an orchid, or I can kind of um, tease, my, tease myself a little bit in, in a way that's loving, you know, as opposed to like, ah, oh, getting bogged down in this sort of depression. I suck and I can't do things that normal, you know, people that don't have fibromyalgia can do, or um, I have to have a special chair because I can't sit in like the usual chair, or um, I can't go to that restaurant because they don't have comfortable chairs. Like I literally choose restaurants based on both food and chairs because if they don't, if it's just stools, like I'm not going to enjoy it. Like this is, it's oh, like yeah. a torture chamber, but I like joke about it. And my friends know like, oh, okay, like she won't like that because the chairs are, so everybody that's at least kind of in the fibro tribe totally gets it. Right. They're like, oh God, yeah, those stools. But I think if you, we can, I don't know. So for me, it's, it's an attitude, I guess I would say. Yeah. Oh, I, I totally get it. Absolutely. I love laughing at myself sometimes in particular. Now I right, think- Like doing your to... Superman on the floor in the kitchen. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I literally, I laugh out loud at myself relatively often. <laughs> um, I mean, it's not always in a positive way. I like that your perspective is more positive. Like, look at these things I- I get to do or look at um, how special I am in this way. I love that you call this orchids. That's phenomenal. I'm going to be using that. <laughs> um, Good. I do like to make fun of myself really just to make light of it sometimes. Yeah. Like um, I actually yell at my hand every so often because it's throbbing for no reason. I'm like, what's wrong? What did I do? Why did I piss <laughs> Is there anything I can do to help you? <laughs> I love that. Like yeah. work with the air. What's the yeah, I personify parts of my body, which that is actually a type of therapy. I don't remember what kind, but it's a sort of talk therapy where you yeah. experience your body separately. And I, I actually really liked when I did that years ago. Um, 
I don't remember what I was going to say, but. Uh... <laughs> well, the one other piece of self-care I wanted to say is that uh, I definitely fall off the self-care wagon. Like there are absolutely activities and choices that make me feel better. Like when I'm eating better food, I feel better. Do I always eat better food? No. I mean, look what I've been eating all day. I've been eating these like peppermint chocolate things. Like, is that a good choice? Mm -mm. But are they yummy and are they right here? Yes, they are. So, so what I've found is that like, I know the things, and most of us, I think, know the things that help us to feel better. Like, I know that if I do my five minutes of stretching in the evening, I'm going to feel better the next day. I know that if I eat uh, less sugar, I'm going to feel better. But I don't always do those things. Um, and then I, I am aware enough about it now that, now that I'm like, okay, I, I, I know that I fell off the wagon. I'm going to get back on the wagon as soon as I, as soon as I can. Um, because life absolutely intervenes. I mean, one of the things that's the hardest for me by far is travel. I have, I want to travel. I want to, I want to give talks to like as many people, as many fibromyalgia providers and patients as I can. And so I've traveled all over the world trying to do that. But I have to say, there's really like travel gives me a flair like nobody's business no matter what i do to my something about sitting in the chair and the i don't know and the food is harder to control and you know the beds suck usually and i just it just is what it is so i try to do the best i can when i'm traveling as far as self-care but sometimes it gets sometimes it gets ugly and i definitely get in a flare um this is where for me cbd can be really helpful um, I found that can kind of reduce inflammation. Um, I've got some topical anti-inflammatory gels that I, I take with me. I've got my little cranial cradle pillow. Um, I think this is where things like um, medications can really help. And I'm, I'm, I'm a proponent of as needed pain medications for fibromyalgia. I think that's totally appropriate. And that's a whole, you know, a whole nother can of worms the whole opioid controversy. But I think recognizing we're not always going to be able to take as good a care of ourselves as we want, whether it's due to work schedules, life schedules, being on parent schedules, um, financial. I mean, I think some people, the reality is they can't afford to eat healthy foods or they might not even be able to afford CBD. It's expensive, you know, like you can't. So you have to do the best you can in the moment that you're in and then uh, give yourself kind of the compassion that you are doing the best you can. And I'm not gonna, I'm really not gonna beat myself up for eating the peppermint chocolate all day, um, but I am gonna like try to not do it tomorrow because I really have noticed that today, maybe my headache is worse because I've been eating not as good, you know? But I'm not, what has really changed for me is that I no longer beat myself up for that. I just notice it. I'm like, oh, wow, I am noticing. I don't feel as well because I didn't really eat lunch. I'm just eating peppermint candy. But I'm not like, you idiot, why are you doing that? You know, like that's, that's to me, that self-care is recognizing the change, doing the best you can to make it, setting the bar so low that you can trip on over it, and then laughing at yourself when you do trip over it and trying to have some some sense of um, of lightness about it. it li life, particularly with chronic illness, gets so heavy and so dark and so isolating and so depressing. And I definitely don't think that depression causes fibromyalgia, but I think fibromyalgia can absolutely cause depression. Because when you're fatigued and you're hurting and you can't do what you want to do and you feel like a failure and you're not able to maybe work as many hours as you want or you're on disability and you don't want to be on disability, you know, like we can really spiral down into this dark, dark, dark place. Um, and anything you can do to kind of help yourself crawl out of that, whether it's watching like kitten videos on YouTube because they make you laugh or whatever, um, laughter has some real power. I mean, it it really does. It creates all sorts of happy chemicals in our, in our brain. Um, and I think if you're laughing at yourself, there's, it, there's almost this, um, 
like additional benefit you can get from it because it's a it's a form of kindness not like mean laughter not like rah you suck laughter but like you know lightness and and sort of a recognition of our of our humanity and how ridiculous we can be sometimes and thinking that we have to have everything just perfect like holidays are a perfect example like it's not about the meal that you made or the decorations it's about like spending time with our loved ones but is that what we worry about no we get all crazy about the house has to look perfect and I'm like, no have the house be messy eat leftover chinese food but just watch a good movie that makes you laugh and enjoy yourself you know what i mean oh i love it i yeah i uh i think that i make a new year's resolution uh for for myself and that is to fall in love with being human i love that yeah i'm gonna do that <laughs> i i just there are so many wonderful things about being human being imperfect there are obviously a lot of shitty things about being that way too but it's all part of what makes us makes our lives valuable also what we have to give valuable and and there's no reason that we can't look at these struggles as opportunities to learn and discover and as you said observe rather than judge there's there's just, there's so much to learn about ourselves and that will never ever ever end and that's the journey i think i want to take myself on this year i love that i will join you on that journey that's a beautiful that's and that is a realistic new year's resolution my dear indeed Yes, I'll write it down somewhere. I do like the idea of when there's something you really want to accomplish or embody or just keep in mind to write it somewhere and tell someone. Well, now I'm telling like a few thousand people. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Accountability, everybody. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, this was um, really splendid. I Yay. <laughs> Very much enjoyed the conversation. Thank you much, so much for coming on the show, Dr. Lipton, Genevra. I uh, thank you for having me. You are wonderful. Thank you. So are you. Good luck with your TED talk. You're gonna rock it. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for listening to technically the first episode of the Wellacopia podcast, part of the Invisible Not Broken Network. If you haven't already, please take the next 30 seconds to do these three things. Hit our subscribe button, tap those stars to give us a rating, even better, a review, and share this episode with a loved one. If you're interested in working with Dr. Lipton, you can visit her site, which is simply drlipton.com. I'll add in the show notes, of course. Her site also has information on treatment, research, and education. If you're also interested in some chronic illness-specific inspiration on a weekly basis, sign up for our Wellspo weekly newsletter. Wellspo stands for Wellness Inspiration, by the way. Each week on Friday afternoons, we'll send you a short email that links to uplifting stories, summaries of new research, giggle-worthy memes, and more. You can sign up for the newsletter on wellacopia.com if you scroll to the bottom of our homepage or on blog.wellacopia.com slash newsletter. Both links will be in the show notes. If you ever want to submit a question or suggestion, feel free to send an email to chronicillnesspodcast at gmail.com. You can reach Monica, myself, or both of us. Thanks again for tuning in. And of course, continue to be kind, be gentle, be badass.